Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you all for coming this morning for our monthly Tread Talk. Ann Palmer's with us again today. I know Ann's no stranger to those of you who are regular attenders to our Tread Talks. Uh, Ann is from Topeka, Kansas, and uh, she's a professional landscape architect and a professional photographer. <laughs> she has a real passion for cars of all types, especially the old vintage classics. And with her photography, she loves taking photographs of cars, especially the hood ornaments or hood mascots on the cars. And she had a beautiful collection of photographs for that. But she just loves cars. She loves doing research. She loves the arts of cars, the designs, the styles, the history. And so every time Ann gets a presentation, I just really enjoy it. She really, so she really goes into depth and not only telling about the car, but the history leading up to the car, which is always really fascinating. So anyway, I'm not going to keep myself up here any longer. I'm going to turn it over to Ann. And so let's give Ann a warm welcome. I'll try to remember to keep this close to my mouth. I have such a loud voice, sometimes I think I don't need it, but I do. Uh, I love doing these programs, and I love history, and I love cars even more. So when it's combined, I thoroughly enjoy it. This has been one of the highlights of my life to be involved with this car museum. It's wonderful, the people are wonderful, and um, you're so lucky you're in Manhattan and have better access to it uh, than I do. We are starting with the 53 Chevrolet Corvette, which is right here. And I am not a uh, professional PowerPoint person, but my neighbor, who has been my Photoshop guru for many years, is a graphic designer. And so he did the cover slide, <coughs> excuse me, for me. And I was talking to Judy, and I hadn't really picked up on it, but this really is the dashboard of that car. So I took a picture and, and sent it to him this morning to say, gee, you know, I'd like to say we planned it for months, but it was accidental, but it's kind of cool. Um, so uh, I'm looking at the audience, and some of you are, um, I'm sure all of you are younger than me, but, but some fairly close. And um, I remember, uh, not vividly, but I remember when the Corvette was introduced. So I wasn't old enough to really understand the scene at the time. So I want to take you back and remind you that Detroit ceased car production uh, February the 9th of 1942 because of the war and converted to making tanks and, and other kinds of, of war material equipment. Most, some resumed in 46 through 48, but really Ford didn't come out with a brand new model till 49 and some of the other manufacturers did not either because of uh, not being able to get a, the, the things they needed, and um, so there were no big Motorama car shows from 1941 to 1953. So the, that's the sort of background that we're, we're looking at when America builds the sports car. I found this four years ago when, when I talked about Corvettes, but it's, I, I think it's excellent. It said Chevrolet was not really well placed to make a sports car. They had about as good a placement as Caterpillar Tractor would have had. Uh, they had no experience, no reputation, no engine, no transmission, and dealers were not used to sports cars. And Chevrolet was uncertain whether there was even a market in middle America for a sports car. So what did Chevrolet have? They had dealers. They had dealers everywhere in most even small towns. They had first class uh, tech and research facilities. They had excellent manufacturing and a well-known brand. They also invested in designers, engineers, and stylists. So they, with all of that, started out and made the most popular and successful two-seater sports car ever built. And I'll tell you what they did have. They had Harley Earl. 
And I don't know how many of you were here June 2nd when I talked about Harley Earl, but I have to laugh. My husband came to that one. I said he didn't have to, but he, he came. And he is, he is not, we'll leave it that he is not a car person. So afterwards he said, oh my gosh, Ann, he said, those people really liked that talk. I mean, they just, you know, were really listening on, to the subject. And then he said, you know, I think that's a subject for just real serious car people. <laughs> so I've always thought if you mention Harley Earl's name and somebody responds, you know you're talking to a serious car person. Um, probably the smartest thing that General Motors ever did was hire Harley Earl in 1923. Uh, at that time, the idea of design and style was foreign <laughs> to cars and it just wasn't popular. And uh, by the time 1953, or actually 1951, came along, Harley Earl was probably the most powerful force in General Motors. And I'll tell you why as, as we go on. But that also made a huge difference, not just in the initial building of the Corvette, but saving it because much of this material, you Corvette people are gonna know a long time before I knew it. But I did not realize that the Corvette did not make money until 1961. And Harley Earl and his power within GM is what kept the brand going. So, this is in the center a I think it's about probably a 54, uh, because in 54 they came out with different colors. It may be a 55. I don't think there was a yellow in, in 54 and certainly not in 53. And then the lower picture of the, of the person is a picture of, of Harley Earl. In 1951, Harley Earl uh, went to Watkins Glen, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with Watkins Glen. Uh, it's on the Finger Lakes, one of the Finger Lakes in upstate New York. Its present population is about 1,800, so I'm not sure it was any, any bigger then, but famous for its racing track. And um, so he went to see a sports car race, was being entertained and stayed at the family of the Chevrolet dealer in Watkins Glen. And he noticed that there were a lot of college boys there who'd come to see the race and that they were driving. It's the 49 Jaguar that Harley Earl really took the idea for the Corvette from. And a Cunningham, which I was not familiar with, but a Cunningham won the race that day in Watkins Glen. And this is another picture of the, of the Jaguar. And so he thought that um, there was a need to build a sports car and that Chevrolet should build a sports car. Oh, and the Morgan. So in uh, 1952, he had a painted and fully trimmed mock-up of what he called his EX-122. It had formerly been called the Opal Project, and that was this car. And he had the backing of Mr. Keating, who was the general manager of General Motors, and of Harlow Curtis, who was then the executive vice president, who very soon became the president of General Motors. It was approved, the mock-up, for, for the January 1953 Motorama, which would be the first big car show since before World War II. The car was fashioned from a new structural material called GRP, glass reinforced plastic, also called fiberglass. Lighter than sheet metal, cheaper to use for a prototype body, no factory retooling needed. But they needed a name. So they had a committee that took from the General Motors employees 300 suggestions but all the committee could agree on was that it needed to be a C name 
and a non-animal name, but they couldn't come up with the name. So the assistant director of the public relations department went home and he literally got out the dictionary and went to the seas and went all through and found the Corvette, which was the name for the smallest class of British warships. And that was where they got the name. They used a popular 235.5 cubic straight six engine and built the show car with an automatic simply because it was easier to produce. Uh, and they were very anxious on a tight schedule to get it out. At the same time, I want to talk about a man named Frank Hershey. And Frank Hershey is probably known best to car people for the design of this 35 Pontiac that, is that where the, yeah, see that chrome kind of design? Apparently that appeared in Pontiacs up until either the late 50s or the 60s, and that was Frank Hershey. And Frank Hershey was a um, mentoree of Harley Earl at General Motors. Uh, but he served in World War II in the Navy, and when he got out of the Navy, they wanted him back, but he really didn't want to, and he wanted to be on, on his own. And so he ended up then going to work for Ford. And at the time the Corvette was being put together, he was the chief stylist and designer for Ford. Now, big difference between Ford and GM. GM, because of Harley Earl, had the last, the design had the last say and the power in the, in the, in the car. Uh, in Ford, the engineers were still in charge and stylists were second. So, no sooner had the name been chosen than Frank Hershey got a picture from a friend at GM that said, our new Corvette. Hershey realized that Chevy would have something that Ford did not have. So he bought an XK120 Jag, those are the letters that go with the, the Jaguar, and he took the same wheelbase, roughed out Ford's answer to the Corvette. No one knew about it, but the design team, because he knew if the executives at Ford found out, it was all over, um, and they could never do it. So now we start to the 53 Motorama show in New York. There were two cars that were the big names from General Motors at that show. One was the LeSabre, which Harley Earl used as his personal vehicle. Uh, I had forgotten how popular jet stuff was in this period because of the jet airplanes in World War II. And this thing in the front kind of looked like a jet engine. And the other was a Cadillac Le Mans, which was never made, uh, strictly a show car. But apparently John Wayne saw this at the show and wanted to buy it. And they said, oh, it's just made of fiberglass, it's not for sale. He said, I don't care if it's made of pudding, I want it. <laughs> but uh, he didn't get it. But it is why he got one of the first Corvettes in 53 to make up for the fact that they wouldn't let him do it. Okay, here is the 53 Corvette at the 53 Motorama in New York. It was, I just, when I saw this, I could not believe it. I, I'm gonna read it to you. you. You have to almost just close your eyes and imagine what this was like. It was a week long run at the Waldorf Astoria on January 16th, the first one since 41. Uh, Road and Track was there, Carcraft, which was a magazine I was not familiar with, uh, but apparently was an expert magazine for hot rodders and drag racing that went from 52 to 2020. Motor Trend and Hot Rod Magazine were all there to cover it. The last two um, were um, celebrated the emergence of a crazy youth culture in LA. 
uh, that centered around George Barris. And if you heard Brian Stout's uh, a few months ago, he talked about George Barris in a thread talk. So in the ballroom at the Waldorf Astoria were 38 cars, all General Motors, some of them these show cars, a full orchestra, a 14-voice chorale group, a bow, this is my favorite, a ballet troupe of 24 dancers doing the story of engineering progress from the discovery of fire and the invention of the wheel to the present time. I, I can't even begin to imagine what, what that must have been like. Uh, there were models in opera gloves and evening gowns by name designers like Christian Dior, in gowns matching the colors of the cars they caressed. Now, all of this, and you can't imagine how many trucks and semis it must have taken, went on a five-city tour uh, they went um, for three months to these five cities, Miami, Kansas City, Dallas, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. The New York show had 50,000 viewers the first day. The Le Sabre, you remember the, with the jet engine on the front, was a hit. Um, they, had, they knew this was Harley Earl's touch had pink leather bucket seats and two French poodles sitting in them. One dyed pink and one dyed blue until the ASPCA in New York in 1953 heard about it and they had to not use the dyed poodles. But the least flashy car got the most buzz, which was this 53 Corvette. And I, I just love that it's right here and, and right there. Um, it was plain white, red leather seats, manually operated black canvas top, minimal chrome ornamentation, which I think you'd have to agree, uh, no outside door handles. And I did not realize that until I started studying this. I mean, I've looked at that car 150 times and didn't realize that it didn't have a door handle. You have to reach inside. Apparently that was a, a thing from European sports cars. Uh, no wind up windows, also like European sports cars. It came with canvas and plexiglass side curtains stored in the trunk and snapped into place in case of inclement weather. That was part of why they found out the American public didn't want that authentic, a European sports car. It was 47 inches at the top, wraparound windshield, which at that time would have been pretty low. And it weighed less than 2,900 pounds. Rounded fenders, front and back, recessed headlights with the mini grills over them. But the most striking feature was the low horizontal grill that framed a set of 13 gleaming teeth formed a face that was a first for a sports car and an instant classic. The second day of the show, Harlow Curtis, the executive vice president, announced they would begin product production in June. They would continue to use the fiberglass body and they would prepare for a production for 10,000 cars a year. Anybody want to guess when they finally sold 10,000 Corvettes? Total? In 61. In 61, the year that they started to break even. That's a long time when he thought they were setting it up for 10,000 that first year. One of the important things this was uh, Harlow Curtis. He was on board and he was the new president. Ed Cole was the chief engineer and he was on board. And a man named T.H. Keating, he was on board. And Alfred Sloan, who was the chairman of the board. All of those people in 1953 at the time of the Motorama were on board with the car and that comes in a distinct difference between Ford and GM. 
and they were all on board because Harley Earl wanted it. Um, one aside that I mentioned in my Jan June 2nd talk about Harley Earl, Alfred Sloan uh, was a longtime GM executive, as was his friend Keating, I mean uh, Kettering, who was um, chairman of research. And I thought, Sloan, Kettering, hmm. And indeed, they took their money uh, that they had made at General Motors and founded the Sloan Kettering Cancer Institute in New York City, which is still probably the most premier uh, cancer treatment place in the United States. And I, I'm, this is probably not a nice thing to say, but I don't think there are many business executives in the country today that have that kind of civic responsibility that Sloan and Kettering had then. Um, anyway, uh, Ford, and I can't believe this, but it, you know, I found its sources. Ford sent a team of engineers to the Waldorf to check out this new sensation, and they let them crawl all over it because they were measuring every single bit of the car. I, you know, no, no, uh, no curvo covert operation there. It was um, uh, pretty, pretty upfront. Uh, Frank Hershey had kept the secret, but the chief Ford engineer found out that Ford had been working on a sports car, and he was livid. Um, the sports car market at that time for the United States was small about 12,000 units a year, and Ford figured, finally, they had to answer. So Ford had an edge on Chevy among hot rodders, custom car enthusiasts, who, prefer, who preferred uh, flathead V8s, and they couldn't cede that territory to Chevy. I will tell you that my deep interest in cars extends only to the outside. So when I read things like flat, uh, head V8, I'm sure you know, but I don't know what that is. <laughs> uh, but it, it helped uh, Ford executives to realize they couldn't just cede all that territory to, to uh, Chevrolet. So the race was on between Hershey, the tortoise, and Earl, the hare, who was already ahead. So Ford reluctantly gave Hershey and his design team the right to pursue a sports car. And this was in January, but they said, May 1st, we have to have a model by May 1st. Well, he clashed Hershey with the superiors on the type of car. This, I think, is a wonderful example of Ford at this time. They wanted a car, they said this, actually, that a banker could drive up to the bank, get out, and people wouldn't point and say, look at that young hot rodder. They wanted a car with dignity, but still a sports car type, but didn't want to call it a sports car. They called it a new term, a personal luxury car. Sounds a little like a watch, uh, maybe. Uh, or they would accept a sportsman or a sports liner, which reminds me of a Peterbilt truck. So anyway. Um, Ford offered the winner of a contest to name the car a $250 Brooks Brothers suit. Now there are two interesting things. It was clear, and it of course was clear, there were no women involved in design in cars at that time who would not have been interested in a $280 Brooks Brothers suit, $250. I checked it out. That would be a $2,800 suit today, which again, I would doubt that there were many car executives today who don't wear $10,000 suits, but this was apparently uh, something that people really jumped to. There were 5,000 submissions to name the car. Um, some of the possibilities, I got a kick out of this, the runabout, the El Tigre, which I'm not sure what that is, the Coronado, the Detroiter, the Hepcat, wouldn't that have been funny? Uh, the Beaver, Beverly, Playboy, 
debonair, tropical, and Seville. I kind of like the Seville, but anyway. The winner, and this differs, I found two different, but I, I took this one, a man named Alden Giberson, who chose the Thunderbird. And they liked that. It had a Native American appeal, um, and they said it was natural for an ad because sounds like thunder, flies like a bird. Um, so there were 300 made, um, and they were coming off a temporary production line in Flint, Michigan, in what I think had been an unused facility, and they kind of quickly got it together to produce them. Um, and they started on June 30th, 1953. There were 300 of them made. How many of those 300 do you think are alive and well today? Anybody? 180. 180, 10, 225. Yeah, kind of makes you wonder what happened to the rest of them. I mean, that's a lot to have kept. And are there still some in, in garages and barns? And probably not. It, would go 110 miles an hour and zero to 60 in 11 seconds. But sales sputtered, shall we say, sputtered. Um, in a bad attempt to create an exclusive image for the car, the division managers at GM limited the availability of this first run of 300 to VIP customers, GM executives, business leaders, politicians, celebrities, and so while a million people saw the Corvette at the Motorama shows across the country, only 180 could purchase them by the end of the year. So after this huge introduction in 53, there were only 108, 100 and, what did I say, 180 sold. So they moved briefly the manufacturing to St. Louis uh, but they were still stuck with a lot of cars. And um, then, of course, they all came out of Kentucky, uh, Bowling Green, after that. Um, but Harley Earl had designed the Corvette for young people, a rambunctious, rebellious car. It was very discordant, though, with the very short film that was made at the Motorama show that showed a couple in their 30s driving the Corvette past mansions in what appeared to be Gross Point, Michigan. Scarcely the market that Harley Earl had thought it would be. And uh, it turns out that that couple cared more about door handles and roll up windows than sports car authenticity. And young people could not afford the price, which was $3,000 to $4,000 in 1953, which I also checked, which is $34,000 to $45,000 today. It was an expensive car in 53, when a lot of people did not have two cars. Um, so that's when I learned it took until 1960 to sell 10,000 cars and make money, and that only Harley Earl had the power to keep it being produced. In 54, they sort of made the same car, but they made it in a few more colors. But they didn't really, they didn't put the V8 engine in it, they didn't improve uh, various things, but uh, these were the different colors. They made it in red, blue, and a very few in black, uh, which I thought's kind of pretty with the red leather interior. Um, so then, they didn't sell either. So you had the backup of the, of the cars left over from the first run and the backup from 54. Um, they, they did change, you could get a beige top uh, in 54. But enter the V8 and that was the 55 because they there was some talk when it didn't sell at all at GM of, of getting rid of it. But Harley Earl, I think, made sure they knew 
that Ford was waiting in the wings with a brand new car. So they put in a V8 engine and did anybody recognize who that is? You bet. You bet. And so in contrast, the Thunderbird debuted in January of 54 as a show car at the Detroit Auto Show and went on sale in December, making it a 55 model to the softly rounded curves of the Corvette. The T-Bird was sleek. It um, had sharply creased edges. Uh, it had roll-up windows, a detachable fiberglass top. That's what I remember as a young kid. You could take the top of it and put it on the ground and drive it, and then when you got, came back, you could put the top back on. Uh, and it had the little round porthole windows. Um, so it also had a V8 and a three-speed manual transmission optional. Uh, and compared to the VET six-cylinder and two-speed power automatic, and they produced and sold 16,000 the first year. That Thunderbird sold really, really well. But after World War II, Ford hired a group of men called the Whiz Kids. They were young, uh, they were businessmen, they weren't car people. Frank Hershey later said they had not a drop of gasoline in their blood, that he didn't think they even liked cars, uh, but they were bean counters. And Robert McNamara was a prime member of that Whiz Kids group. Um, he didn't care how well the Thunderbird was selling. He wanted to kill it. Um, and so apparently he went to Frank Hershey. And Hershey, he told Hershey that he said, you know on the dashboard of these cars, remember Hershey was the stylist. He said, it's ridiculous to make new dashboards every year. I want a dashboard that we can use for like six years. And Frank Hershey said, you know, kids, when they're young, they look at dials and all, and they like to think that they're doing something cool. And he said, every person who drives a Ford automobile wants to think that they're in charge of that car, and they love the dashboard and the dials, and they want to see new inventive things every year. And uh, McNamara said, I don't care. You know, that's a foolish expense. And so Hershey said to McNamara, I don't think you ever were a child. And he then fired him. And um, they then in 58 made the four-seater Thunderbird. And the only year that, that the sort of really cute Thunderbirds were made were 55, 56, and 57. So the one thing that comes out of the contest, first of all, Thunderbird saved Corvette because they were going to cancel it till they heard Ford was making it. Then Ford was sort of saved uh, the Thunderbird by Corvette when it came out. But what really saved um, the Corvette at General Motors in addition to Harley Earl was that Ford showed what the market was for sports cars. I mean, they're selling 16,000 sports cars in a year. Um, you know, we gotta, we gotta look hard at ours and, and make some changes. So um, it, was, it was interesting. <laughs> um, I found some of these, which I, it's just sheer entertainment, but own America's number one fun car right now. And this was an ad for this car. This is a pretty good one, which interestingly enough shows two older women uh, in the Corvette, uh, which I don't think was its market. Interestingly, they said the Thunderbird tended to be bought by the country club crowd and also by women. Um, with, it's never been true of the Corvette, as many of you I'm sure know. The Corvette is a man's car. In my whole life I've only known two women who drove a Corvette as their primary car. 
Now maybe there are lots more that I don't know, but it's notoriously known as a, as a man's car. And I, I found an interesting demographic in doing this research, which I knew about the male, and I knew about the fact it's an older demographic, maybe 55 plus, uh, that own Corvettes. But this I did not know until I did this research. This is new, that prior to 2020, the average income of a Corvette buyer was $76,000 a year, which is high for a, a car, average car buyer. Uh, but in 2020 onwards, the average income of a Corvette buyer has been 215000 Very interesting. And when asked on the survey, what car were you considering in addition to the Corvette you bought, the answer was predominantly a Porsche. So I think we're looking at a very different addition to Corvette. That, and I don't know why exactly. Uh, the mid-engine, uh, the design, I, I, don't, I don't know. That's for you to, to think about, but I, I do believe the, the research. Um, that one I've always, I just love. Um, the United States of America, very patriotic flag behind and, and uh, probably the 55 Corvette. Um, <laughs> This two iconic cars, the Chevy, Sh I always say Chevy and my family always says it's Chevy with an E, but I'll try. With the Sh Chevy on one side and, and then the Corvette uh, in front of a, I would think, typical California hamburger place. Magazines featuring uh, the Corvette, um, then how, are there people here who remember the TV show Route 66? Yes, yes, Martin Milner and George Maharis. And what I didn't remember was it did not follow Route 66. They just sort of did random cities, a different city every show, but it, it had very little to do with Route 66, but it had a lot to do with Corvettes and I think the coolness factor of a Corvette. This is pretty good. I, if there is a Class B movie, this might have been a Class B movie. I don't think it was a, a big seller, but um, Stingray, uh, and I have learned which ones were Stingrays with one word and which one were Stingrays with two words, and that took me a long time to learn that. So this was in the <coughs> later years. Here's again Drag Strip Riot with uh, names that I have never heard uh, out of Hollywood. I thought at the end you might enjoy, uh, because not being a Corvette owner, I've had a very hard time identifying Corvettes over the years. And I know they come in the groups. So I took the first year of each group and got a picture as a kind of final closing as to what came from this car. This was C1, um, 53 to 62. Second generation, C2, 63 to 67. Uh, and we have one out here. Third generation, 68 to 82, which was 14 years, which I think is incredible. And then the fourth generation, the C4, and I apologize for the stuff, the glare on the window, but I like the picture. Then the C5, then the C6, the C7, from 14 to 19, and then the 8th, 2020. Okay. So. That's it. Let's give Anne a warm thank you. Thank you.